So colleagues, let, we, let, uh, let us start. We have a panel of today. We have still one minute, right? Uh, the uh, colleagues, I would I would like to apologize uh, at the beginning if I will pronounce um, names, surnames, not in a very um, proper way. I hope you will forgive me and you will correct me as well. Let us start. Uh, the third panel of this workshop that uh, my deep uh, thanks to Carleton University in particular, Professor John de Bardeleben for organizing and stimulating uh, organization of the workshop and debate is taking place in an extremely complicated geopolitical environment. We will discuss one of the components that uh, is um, necessary to uh, understand and to see what uh, and how we proceed with this. The topic is the sanction regime, assessing the effectiveness. Uh, as it is written in the program, the panel will assess sanctions effectiveness and transatlantic unity with the comparative perspectives. Uh, we will focus on the following issues as extreme importance of sanctions, at uh, the same time being very problematic and controversial topic. We will talk about multidimensional nature of sanctions, economic and non-economic. We'll talk about different sanctions regime regimes and decision-making process as, for example, multilateral. We'll discuss different actors in the current geopolitical context. We'll talk about the political and economic interest behind sanctions of different actors. We will talk as well about the impact and effectiveness of sanctions. We we'll have a, a panel of very distinguished speakers. Uh, we have Dane Roblands, Professor, Norman Patson School of International Affairs, Carleton University, Canada. We have Krina Vilu Milusevich, Associate Professor, Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, Carleton University, as well as Canada. We will have Liga Anderson, uh, who is a counselor working part of a foreign relation councils, uh, the Council of the EU, permanent representation of the Republic of Latvia to the EU. We have Clara Portella, who is a young doctor, a University of Valencia, Spain. Uh, we have, you see, uh, two people from Canada in the panel. We have a uh, European country, Spain, and we have European country, Latvia, that is representing by Liga and myself. Uh, my name is Tatiana Muravska, as you can see, and I'm professor of the University of Latvia and Riga Stradinch University. Let me uh, give a floor first to our speaker, a prominent speaker, Dane Rowlands, uh, who is um, um, having his PhD in economics from University of Toronto. He has been teaching at Carleton University in the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. He served as associate director of this school in 2002-2012 uh, and director 2012-2013, oh, sorry, 17, and as a co-director of the Infrastructure Protection and International Security Program 2009-2020 uh, and director 2020-2020. Two. He was the inaugural holder of the Patson Chair in International Affairs. The research interests of uh, Dane uh, include international economic policy, international debt, multilateral financial institution, official development assistance, international migration, terrorism, conflict and development. He has published over 60 refereed journal articles of books, chapters, and teaches international public economics, 
quantitative methods, international financial institutions, policy, and the economics of conflict. So uh, we thank you very much for being with us today and looking forward to your presentation day. And thank you very much. Okay, great. So um, thanks again for the invitation to do this. Uh, it's a little bit out of my area, but I've been working a lot on sanctions in the context of economics of conflict. And so my role uh, today that uh, I, I seize and let all the hard work be done by the other panelists is uh, to just give an overview of sanctions in terms of theory and empirics and what they tell us about what is likely to occur uh, in the context of Russia. So I'm just going to look at them as in the, in the theory of deterrence, which we had a little bit of a discussion of in the previous panel, the cycle of how they work, what's the evidence from some of the historical studies, and what this implies for an effective sanctions regime now. So uh, sanctions have always been part of, international, of the international system, international affairs, and warfare. So it's not a surprising event uh, to, to observe in the context of the invasion of Ukraine. But after World War I, sanctions were primarily seen as a way of deterring uh, conflict, a way of deterring uh, aggressors from engaging in, con in war because they were seen as being so overwhelmingly negative uh, against a target state that nobody would dare to use it. But obviously, that's not been the case. And so in the context of that formalization of sanctions as seen primarily as a deterrence, uh, the, the deterrence theory tells us that it requires credibility, that the punishment will in fact occur. And that is largely a function of what is the cost uh, absorbed by the sender or the countries that are implementing the sanctions. And they have to be effective in the sense that they inflict sufficient punishment on the target state to deter it from engaging in undesirable activities. So the first thing that we learned from this is that if we observe actual sanctions, it means that the deterrence capacity has failed. And the reason we suspect that deterrence will have failed is at least in part because the prior assessment of the costs by the target state uh, of the credibility of the effectiveness of the sanctions is, uh, is uh, that, that they won't be sufficient. Either they won't be imposed or they won't be uh, given, uh, they won't have enough a negative impact on the target state that, that it will deter them from their activity. So we already know that deterrence has failed. And one of the things that this means is that once uh, we observe cases of deterrence, it really severely uh, affects how we can assess them because the primary role of sanctions has already, in a sense, failed. So why would we use them if, say, if the deterrence has failed and we're imposing sanctions, why? Because we know that they're unlikely to have the effect that we would like, although that, that's, uh, there are grounds for uncertainty that may make them effective. But first of all, they will inhibit the target's military capability, we would hope. I uh, hope that it would erode the political support for the target regime. And finally, we have domestic audience uh, or purposes uh, we may want to just um, signal our disapproval of the actions. So to properly assess sanctions, we need to know their purpose or objective. And that means what was the objective of the target state and then what are we using these sanctions for if the deterrence has failed? So in terms of assessing sanctions and when it was some of the difficulties of this, first, there's a timing component to sanctions. So in the short term, sanctions probably won't have that big an effect. And the reason is because uh, countries and, and firms and people will have inventories of things and these need to run down before they really begin to need to adjust. And similarly, equipment won't wear out in the short term. So the, the, the short term effects might be relatively mild. The more severe effects will tend to be in the middle term, and that's probably where we are now in the context of the Russian case. So uh, inventories of many key goods will be running out, and there will be no substitutes available, uh, and the parts and machinery used in production will begin to run out, and, and those uh, will be more difficult to replace. So it's difficult. This is the, the difficult transition between long-term independence, uh, which is the third stage, where the economy will become more self-sufficient, but it will also be less productive. Uh, and we've got this cost yet in the, in the short term uh, uh, where we have to replace critical goods. So we're probably somewhere in that stage, but the difficulty of assessing that is that it depends on the sector. So different sectors have different levels of inventory, uh, different need for spare parts, different dependence on, international, uh, uh, on the international system and different abilities to substitute this. So that makes it very difficult to assess or predict what the likelihood of sanctions uh, costs will be, uh, which complicate, of course, uh, 
the assessment by states with respect to do they do they risk sanctions or do they impose sanctions. The, the uh, historical reference on assessing the success of sanctions is by Huffbauer Shaw Elliott, uh, which reviewed the Cold War sanctions period. Uh, they identify in that study what, this, what they think the center's objectives is, and I think Clara and some of her work will emphasize the importance of assessing uh, what the goal of sanctions are. But they, they, they code these as success or failure, and then they, they look at these cases and they try to distill what are the lessons uh, that we can learn about sanctions. So I want to take these key lessons from, from that uh, Half Power Shot Elliott book and indicate what this means in terms of Russia. So here are the six key findings from Half Power Shot Elliott uh, that would suggest to us that the Russian sanctions won't work. First of all, they rarely worked historically in the context of ending military operations. So when, with, when key military objectives were at stake or security objectives were at stake, sanctions rarely seemed to be effective. Second, you need to have most key countries applying sanctions with no important spoilers. And again, in the context of Russia, countries like India and China and others are clearly not participating fully in the sanctions regime. And, and that would suggest, again, a likely failure. They rarely work against strong countries. Again, uh, this, this suggests uh, they, they won't work against Russia. They work best against, against, against allies because those countries tend to be more dependent on the sending states and that won't uh, apply here. Incremental sanctions typically fail uh, more like or more likely to fail than those which are imposed uh, all at once. Uh, and we've seen over the case of, of Ukraine sanctions just ratcheting up slowly as opposed to being uh, a, a once on very hard set of, of, of sanctions. And we know why it's because the cost to the center states is so exorbitant as well. And finally, um, uh, the high cost on center states, as I said, uh, is associated with failure. So that's what we would expect here because of the high dependence on hydrocarbons from Russia. There are a few more encouraging lessons from the historical studies uh, that suggest that the economic effects have to be in the target range around 4 to 5% of GDP. And recent estimates in the case of Russia have put the recession uh, put the, the level of decline in their GDP in that range. Uh, and so maybe we might have some grounds for more optimism. Uh, the second thing uh, in favor is that the sanctions instruments being chosen now are becoming more effective. They're choosing good ones, uh, which Hofbauer Shot Elliott suggests are critical for success. And finally, uh, and perhaps most important, is that sanctions rarely work unless they're accompanied by other kinds of policies and other kinds of costs. And again, Ukraine has done uh, uh, well above average or well, well above expectations with respect to imposing military costs uh, on Russia. So that so sanctions then become part of an overall uh, framework for deterring Russia from escalating further or perhaps encouraging it to, to withdraw. So the final thing I would say is uh, that the, the current sanctions regime has some difficulties that we've seen in this context. And I think the problem is that after 1990, we rarely saw sanctions imposed extensively on key states uh, in this kind of a context. Mostly they were targeting uh, weaker states. And so this is kind of an unusual thing to be observing in the post Cold War period. So. The, they weren't well planned in the sense that they were piecemeal and ad hoc, uh, incremental. They failed to target the hydrocarbon exports at the beginning due to high costs. As a consequence, uh, uh, it's, it's much harder to predict what the sanctions regime that Russia was going to face would look like. Uh, second key problem is lots of non-participating states, including some very important ones in terms of uh, international uh, economic size. The third is that the current sanctions regime uh, is problematic insofar as they may violate the, state, the laws of, of sending states. And I think that there, this is part of the ad hoc dimension of the, of the kinds of sanctions that we've seen. So for example, example seizing uh, sovereign assets, there is a lack of clarity with respect to the legality of uh, those kinds of policies. Uh, most states have laws on sovereign, uh, on sovereign um, immunity. And we haven't really seen how these will play out in the context of the current round of sanctions. And finally, uh, I think the, uh, a big problem is that the lack of multilateral support uh, has contributed to the erosion of a global system uh, and the creation of competing independent blocs. So in effect, 
we're, we're, we're walking slowly towards a path whereby countries are being divided into you're with us or you're against us, and that has problems for the functioning of the international system as a whole. So I would argue that what is needed, uh, and this is a little bit more uh, speculative, but, uh, but uh, is a clear multilateral regime uh, to enhance sanctions credibility, uh, predictability and effectiveness with wider multilateral acceptance. And finally, I think it's what we're lacking is rules for calibrating sanctions to avoid the overuse of extreme measures, which can erode effectiveness over time. And so we're seeing this, for example, in the context of financial systems, uh, excluding countries from the financial system can work well in the short term in terms of imposing costs, but over time it encourages states outside of that, uh, uh, say, states which may be subject to sanctions eventually to find alternatives, uh, and we're already seeing that being developed in the context of China. So that's, that's a broad context, I think, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues to uh, give you more of the specifics about Russia. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to share the, the panel with, with my colleagues. Uh, and of course, thank you, uh, Tatiana, for the introduction. Um, I think uh, Dane have proposed a very good framework that it's used mainly by uh, you know, scholars to assess the effectiveness of, of the sanctions. And um, uh, I, I think Clara will, will do that later uh, in the panel. However, my focus uh, today will be on the European Union sanction uh, system of governance. Um, as, as you can see, and I hope everyone can see the, um, the presentation, uh, I'm going to focus in the next few minutes on the role of the EU member states um, uh, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the adoption and the implementation of the sanctions regimes. Um, so um, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, led to a fast response from the EU and its member states um, and um, translated the response translated first and foremost in the imposition of sanctions that we all know and uh, um, on sanctions uh, on Russia and Belarus. Uh, the sanctions on Russia added to already existing sanction regimes uh, in place since 2014 uh, that were imposed as a result of the illegal annexation uh, of Crimea. So now the new package of sanctions on Russia um, um, has been described by, by EU leaders and policymakers as without precedent. Um, so uh, I would say that the speed and the extensive nature of the EU sanctions regimes came to many as a surprise, given two, two elements, the EU system of governance, uh, where national and EU policy towards Russia coexist, as we'll talk in a moment. And of course, the second, the important uh, economic interdependence between the EU and Russia. So as you can see here uh, in this short presentation, first I would like to outline the EU sanction system of governance by outlining the, the role of the member states and compare it to the American and Canadian uh, sanctions uh, regimes. And um, by drawing some lessons from the post 2014 support for the sanction regime by the member states. Um, First of all, I will start by saying that sanctions have become a very important uh, tool for the European uh, Union foreign policy. And in fact, uh, their use has increased by more than, than three times uh, in the past 30 years. Um, the EU can impose sanctions in, uh, in three main ways, multilateral, which are in fact sanctions imposed by the United Nations that are transposed in the European Union law. Um, autonomous sanctions, but supplementary to the United Nations sanctions, and autonomous, autonomous sanctions outside of the UN framework, which are mainly the ones that I'm referring to uh, today. Um, the, the development of EU sanctions regime um, is a very complex process, and it involves several actors. Uh, just to uh, briefly summarize, the proposal of the new restrictive measures come from the uh, high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. However, the decision to impose, uh, amend, lift, or renew sanction is taken by the Council of the European Union, um, where decisions regarding sanctions are taken based on unanimity voting. So practically all EU member states have to be on board. Um, EU member states are also in charge of the implementation of sanctions, 
And also once enacted, sanctions are subject to periodic renewal, uh, which must be again agreed by unanimity voting in the Council of the EU. So I would say that each member state enjoys a veto power uh, and the sanctions regime can be discontinued on account of a single uh, negative vote. Now in comparison, uh, in, the US, in the US, the things are simpler. Uh, the US constitution establishes the full authority of the federal government, the president and Congress. And in fact, the sanctions can be imposed by congressional acts or presidential executive orders. In Canada, uh, similarly, the Special Economic Measures Act um, is the umbrella for unilateral sanctions. And in fact, the Minister of Foreign Affairs has the authority to, to promulgate uh, regulations uh, that impose sanctions on, on foreign countries. So to conclude, the use sanctions decision-making process is complex and decisions can be delayed uh, uh, due, to, to, due to the necessary negotiations uh, between the, the member states. Um, so if we look at uh, the post-2014 sanctions, uh, when, uh, which were imposed on Russia due to annexation of Crimea, um, despite the diverse levels of support of the EU member states, um, these sanctions packages were consistently renewed. Uh, the strong supporter of sanctions um, among the EU member states included, uh, you know, the Baltic states, Poland, Romania, the Nordic countries, UK, which was a member state at the time. Uh, while at the opposing end, we found a number of countries, including uh, Bulgaria, Cyprus, uh, Greece, uh, Hungary, uh, Austria, um, and, and originally we've seen uh, France and Germany taking more of a middle middle positions. Um, so leaders of, of, of certain EU member states both voiced skepticism about the, the effectiveness of sanctions and, and their continuation. Additionally, some of the EU member states, as you can see here, have continued their partnership with Russia despite the sanctions regime. Um, also, based on the various evaluations, uh, the, the economic impacts of sanctions cannot explain on their own the national positions regarding Russia. For example, Germany, which eventually became a strong supporter of sanctions, is one of the most hit uh, economies by the sanctions, while Greece is at the end of the opposing end of the spectrum. So, of course, the question that was raised since 2014 on is how can we explain the continuous consensus on sanctions um, since 2014? And and I'm listing here a few arguments that were at the core of the debate uh, in the scholarly um, uh, literature. Uh, one is referring to the severity of the Russian threat that enabled the EU to come together, especially uh, with a sudden change in the German foreign policy towards Russia. Other argument focuses on the leadership and support by the most powerful member states, uh, plus an alliance of frontline states. Um, other explanation uh, uh, considers the alteration of the decision-making process that I previously uh, mentioned was a direct mandate by the European Council. So practically the EU heads and of state and government have decided the sanctions must be imposed against third actors with the strong expectation that the other EU institutions will follow their, their guidance and draft the necessary legal act. Domestic politics were considered to be, uh, uh, an, um, you know, um, one of the explanation, meaning uh, referring to the different uh, uh, interest groups, um, and of course the the use of usual techniques of consensus building, uh, providing side payments, log rolls, and and so on. Um, I think for the for the European Union, the question of its uh, internal cohesion uh, will be essential in the coming years, um, and since. Um, the invasion of uh, Ukraine in February of 2022, uh, the EU has imposed seven packages of new sanctions um, on Russia, in addition to the existing uh, measures. This include, among um, other measures, an import ban on all Russian seaborne crude oil and petroleum uh, refined products, which will be applied gradually uh, within six months for crude oil and within eight months for other refined petroleum products. Now, given that about 27% of the European crude oil was imported from Russia 
Um, the new sanctions will have important effects on the EU economy, but of, of course, it has different effects on uh, different member states. As you can see here, um, uh, you know, we have Germany, Netherlands, and Poland, which are the largest importance of uh, and, uh, the largest importers of, of uh, the Russian uh, uh, oil by volume in 2021, while six EU member states rely on Russia for more than half of their oil imports. So Germany and Poland supported the decision to ban all imports of oil. Uh, however, Hungary, Slovakia, and Czech Republic raise concerns about such ban due to their uh, dependence on oil transported by pipeline, pipelines. So the final decision included only seaborne oil, which means that the three countries will be temporarily exempted. Additionally, Bulgaria and Croatia obtained temporary derogations until the end of 2024 and 2023, respectively. So there are already, we see uh, 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 much more negotiations going on and, and discussions about an aid package of sanctions have started, as you can see every day on the news, in light of the Russian annexation referendums in the four Ukrainian regions. However, the proposal of imposing further sanctions on energy, including nuclear, the oil price cap, or the oil, also other products such as diamonds is highly disputed by some of the member states. So I would say that the, the political disagreement on this topic are deepening. Um, there is a growing support for nationalist and Eurosceptical platforms in some of the EU founding member states and uh, um, the elections in Italy last Sunday speaks towards that, uh, but also in, in some other states. I'll say, for example, on September 23rd, Hungary's governing party, Fidesz, announced that it plans to call for a national cons consultation on energy sanctions, which were imposed by Brussels elite uh, and which destroy Europe's economy. Other EU countries with large shipping uh, fleets, including Greece, Malta, and Cyprus, have also criticized the, the ban. And, and one other aspect that uh, I will focus is the national polls on various topics related to the war in Ukraine conducted by Eurobarometer this summer, uh, June, June, July, I believe, um, shows that large percentages of the population in certain, which are shown here, of the population in certain countries, including uh, you know, so Slovakia, Croatia, uh, Czech Republic, Cyprus, Bulgaria, and Greece, uh, are rather and not at all satisfied with the EU response to the war in Ukraine, while the, the highest level of dissatisfaction regarding the economic sanctions are pretty much in the same uh, member state. What is important to note about these polls is that it compares the results of the summer with April, May, with the spring poll. And in all member states, we see, uh, in most of the member states, uh, majority of them, in fact, we see an increased dissatisfaction with the EU response and with the economic sanctions. Uh, so diversity, I would say, is the defining, uh, defining characteristic of these discourses. And, and, and uh, to end, uh, without trying to be speculative and without even discussing the effectiveness of sanctions, given that they represent one of the most important response to the Russian aggression against Ukraine, we have to be aware of the complications related to the sanctions adoption and the threat of being discontinued or not expanded uh, further um, to, to sectors that would have important impacts on, on uh, Russian economy, but also on the European Union economy. Thank you. So thanks very much, uh, Grina. And uh, thank you, Tatiana, for this kind introduction. So I'm aware that we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to try to keep the presentation short. So basically, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, talking with a brief, well, uh, talking about the impacts of the sanctions uh, on Russia. And then uh, in a second step, uh, I will introduce some nuance or some qualification to these, well, to basically to the, the uh, analysis of the economic impacts. So um, what, just briefly, um, economic sanctions have triggered an economic crisis in Russia. The, the central bank expects that in the fourth quarter of uh, the present year, the country's gross domestic product um, will shrink. The combined effect of financial sanctions, a technology embargo, as well as retreating international businesses have uh, restricted Russian access to components, uh, materials, and machinery. 
uh, that in some cases are uh, quite critical. So uh, exports, um, well, uh, while imports from sender countries uh, have fallen by 50% to uh, 90%, um, exports have been booming uh, after February in 2000. Well, uh, in 22, thanks to high energy prices, and I think that the difficulty um, of imposing sanctions that uh, have um, uh, energy uh, implications is something that have, has, uh, has already been mentioned in this panel and actually also in the previous panel. Uh, in any case, coupled with the decline in imports, this actually led to um, an unprecedented surplus uh, in well uh, in the in, in the previous months. And this surge in exports has helped the Russian regime to stabilize uh, the economic situation and bring down inflation. So that um, on the one hand, we find positive elements and on the other hand, we find negative elements so that the picture altogether is quite mixed. Uh, importantly, a federal budget revenue um, is shrinking due to the economic crisis triggered by sanctions. And uh, sanctions have also significantly tightened uh, the fiscal room for the authorities. Uh, however, the uh, starting point for them was favorable as the budget was actually in a good shape when the crisis started. And the situation has not reached a critical point yet. Uh, this mean, well, this um, implies or this um, has to do with the fact that the Kremlin can still mobilize additional resources by redirecting spending within the budget, resorting to funds from the National uh, Welfare Fund, and also um, printing money at least for a, at least for a, a short time frame. So um, this, this would be a mini summary of what the uh, economic situation looks like following the impact uh, of sanctions. And now in a second step, I would like to briefly uh, introduce some nuance here. Um, first of all, um, when we look at the impacts of, of sanctions and how they can affect the, the, um, the current um, in military operations, we have to take into account that there is a fundamental inadequacy between uh, the timing uh, of sanctions in the sense that they need a lot of time to, uh, this, to deploy their effects and the timing of military force, which is actually very fast. And this refers to something that has already been mentioned by the presentation of um, uh, the, the presentation by Professor Rowlands. Uh, secondly, uh, well, an important aspect, another important aspect to take to take into account, is that uh, the um, uh, the Kremlin prepared uh, for the sanctions uh, well before these sanctions started. While uh, on our side, we didn't actually um, uh, prepare for it at all. Actually, we started preparing when uh, the, the military intervention was, uh, in, was imminent. And um, the, the EU has basically been uh, crafting its sanctions strategy um, while the military operation was ongoing. So this preparation on the side of the Kremlin started already um, in 2014. And um, from that point in time, it basically prioritized the strengthening of the country's resistance to economic pressure. Uh, this included um, mainly import substitution efforts, but also it included measures such as, uh, for example, the fact that the central bank uh, uh, switched some reser reserves from dollar into, into Chinese yuan in an effort to protect uh, these reserves from, uh, from the possible effects of sanctions. And I mean, there has also been a, a, an alternative to the SWIFT system introduced uh, in anticipation of a possible SWIFT suspension. Now, uh, in addition to that, and probably, uh, well, uh, most importantly, uh, before taking a look at the economic impacts uh, of sanctions, one should actually explore what the rationale of such sanctions are. 
uh, what's, um, in which way they were actually meant to affect the target. And interestingly, here we can identify two different rationales uh, that um, operate together in the uh, calculations uh, of the EU or in the way in which, they, um, in which the EU um, designed its sanctions. So um, one of these rationale that we could um, call the classical approach um, foresees that sanctions will generate sufficient economic deprivation to galvanize the population against the leadership. So actually, according to the classical approach, sanctions should affect the, the economic um, situation of the country altogether. But an alternative uh, approach uh, emphasizes um, more um, the, um, the effects on specific uh, sec uh, sectors of the economy or of specific elites. And this uh, logic can be labeled a more selective lo logic that, um, well, that tries to uh, alter the power balance within the target country. And uh, under this logic, uh, measures are meant to strengthen the opposition forces while disadvantaging the ruling regime and their associates in a bit to promote the withdrawal of support uh, uh, from, um, from, the, uh, from uh, the withdrawal of elite support from the, um, the, um, uh, uh, the leadership. And I mean, this basically relies on the idea that business, military, and uh, sometimes, uh, well, other sorts of elites back the ruling regime because they benefit politically and economically from it. So the moment in, uh, in which sanctions manage to reduce the revenue available um, to the ruling regime, they be, uh, they, um, the ruling regime becomes un unable to distribute or redistribute this wealth among the elites, compelling them to withdraw support from the leadership and promote their replacement. So what is uh, new about the present approach that the EU has, has adopted vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, its target is that both rationales are activated at the same time. And this is something that departs from the EU's traditional approach of applying only a selective logic. So targeting only specific elites and not affecting the economy or sectors of the economy as a whole. So um, this, this is what makes uh, the federal uh, budget or the effects on the federal bu uh, budget um, particularly important in this specific sanctions effort, which uh, is not something that the EU has been trying to do with its previous sanctions regimes on, a, on, other, on other targets around the world. So to conclude, just um, what are the impacts on the population and what are the impacts on the elites? So, uh, well, given that, this, um, that these segments have such, a, such high relevance for the selective approach that, that is typical uh, of, uh, of the EU uh, policy. So here, what we find is that the a decrease in the um, in the standard of living it will not be felt uh, by the population until um, a few months into the sanctions um, effort, and uh, the same well the, uh, the same can be said about elites. So among the broader population, actually only the um, the upper middle middle class uh, has already been directly affected. And at the same time, uh, the measures that have been put in place, even though they um, will um, deploy their effects in a noticeable manner, uh, only um, uh, in the well, uh, only in the coming months, they uh, will have long-term uh, effects, and they will be much more difficult to reverse than uh, than. Uh, other tools that the EU has been imposing uh, in the past in other cases in which the, um, the approach was much more selective. So I believe we don't have a lot of time left, so I'll leave it here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Clara, so much. Uh, thank you uh, to all our speakers. Uh, we will start now the second round, which will consist of questions and colleagues your answers. Let me use uh, 
my position as a chair and to start with the question. And then I will pass the floor to John de Bardeleben with uh, questions. Uh, as far as I know, John has questions. So my would be the following. Um, Clara mentioned uh, in her last words that people will um, feel sanctions uh, soon, but uh, uh, not, not yet. My question would be the following. We have sanctions from one hand. We have pressure from outside world, uh, which means in Russia, which means that we already have brain drain, we already have lower consumption, we already have, for example, difficulties for people to get loans for real estate. Uh, obviously, businesses are suffering and uh, industries, many industries are showing their downturn. Uh, we have fall down in GDP. Nevertheless, recently, Russia announced uh, a national budget with significant military spending for the next three years, which uh, obviously facilitate the discussion on measures how to stop the war. So again, we have pressure from outside world. At the same time, we have a milit increase in military spending. And at the same time, we have pressure inside uh, the country because there are very uh, poor governance of the country at all the levels. It's destroying, uh, in fact, the country uh, Putin already put uh, restrictions on gas going to Europe, which means already uh, participating of Putin in sanctions, the European Union proposed. So what we would like to achieve, uh, we would like to have people even to become more poor, or we would like to decrease the military spending. And what type of sanctions then we might use, if any, in future. Thank you very much. It was my question. John, please go ahead with your questions. Yeah. OK, I have a couple of specific questions and then a general question to all the panelists. The first question is for Krina. Um, in the data that you showed, you indicated a kind of increasing ambivalence toward um, the EU measures regarding among the public regarding the, the war against uh, the war in Ukraine. And I'm wondering in the, that public opinion data, is some of that dissatisfaction that the measures aren't strong enough? I mean, having listened to our previous panel, it seems that there might be some sentiment, especially in some of the border countries, that the dissatisfaction has to do with the measures actually not being strong enough rather than too strong. So is, does that, is that unpacked anywhere? And does that indicate uh, increasing polarization of viewpoints rather than simply a kind of overall, uh, you might say, sanction fatigue? And also to you, um, despite the insufficiencies of, of policies that may have existed, do you think that the EU adds value? In other words, if the, if the member states had acted alone, would we have gotten a less robust response than we're getting with the, the collective response, which might be something overlooked um, in terms of when one thinks of the inadequacies compared to what, you know, compared to what, what is the EU adding as value? Is there an added value? Or would we have had an even stronger reaction if member states had acted alone, which I somewhat doubt, but I'm curious what you think. Then second, um, in terms of uh, Dane's idea of moving from the stage two where there are some impacts when the shortages tend to occur in stage three, where the member state, where the target state adapts. I'm wondering if the fact that the sanctions rolled out between 2014 and 2022 may have made that progression more quicker. In other words, that Russia already was kind of in a position of responding to sanctions. So it, it, it had some tools available to allow it to transition from stage two to three more quickly in some sectors, because I think this import substitution process has probably been you know, fairly um, well prepared for in Russia. And then finally, a question to all of you. I, I asked myself with this annexation of the announced annexation, proclaimed annexation of these four regions by Russia today, whether what's left in the toolbox? Is there what, you know, it's hard for me to imagine what, what remains for the, for the allied countries to do 
to respond? Has the toolbox of sanctions been exhausted? Or do we have some other tools that we can pull out? Thank you. Yes, please. Who would like to start? I could start. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Uh, especially to the targeted questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a, an answer for the last question of John, but the general question. But uh, regarding the first two questions, I completely agree with the polls. I haven't seen anywhere, um, uh, you know, a description of what these results mean for each member state yet. And I, I think that's one problem with these polls that they, uh, they are not very transparent. They are like black boxes. We see <laughs> an increase in the disapproval, but I would agree looking at certain countries such as Poland, Baltic states, I would uh, certainly think that the disapproval is in fact because they are not enough uh, and the EU hasn't answered enough. So I think it is, uh, like, like I mentioned, I think it's a the diversity is the word of the uh, of the day of the months. You know, we, we have very different political views um, re within the European Union uh, regarding the, the the continuation and the uh, increased um, expansion of sanctions. Um, strengths of the EU. Are, I completely agree that the EU is um, is providing strength to the sanction regime in the sense that it provides uh, a goal towards the members towards which the member states can work. Uh, we have the what they are called the hawkish member states that want to impose much stronger sanctions. But if you look at their domestic policy, there are different interest groups that are pushing towards not imposing such strong actions. So kind of uh, come up with with a. a uh, a sanctioning regimes that will take into account their interest as well. While we we'll have the other member states, the Dovish member states, which are not pro sanctions, that at least they are pushed to work towards something else, towards uh, to, to reach a, a common ground with the other EU member states. So I, I certainly think it's stronger uh, as, as a EU rather than EU member states. Uh, I believe that if uh, member states would be allowed to implement their own sanctions, we would see many of them uh, not necessarily participating. Um, and then we'll provide Russia with the possibility of continuing their uh, normal economic activity with certain new member states uh, rather, and not with others. Yeah, so um, I certainly think that having the EU pushing for a certain policy, it brings, uh, it brings <laughs> Cohesion, cohesion between the member states and they achieve uh, uh, to, to um, kind of isolate uh, from certain perspective uh, uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russia. Okay, left in the toolbox. If you ask me about sanction, I don't think much is left in the toolbox. I'm, I'm not necessarily um, uh, thinking that, um, you know, um, sanctions on gas or nuclear will necessarily have a political impact on, on Russia. Um, as long as Dane has mentioned, there are other countries there and large players would, where, where these resources can re be redirected, maybe not in short term, but certainly in, in medium and long term. Um, and I think one of the speakers from uh, the, the previous panels was mentioning the goal should be to to reduce the the price of these resources so we don't finance it, we don't finance the war in in, in uh, the military and I don't think that sanctions on on energy will result in that so uh, from sanctions perspective it's from my opinion <laughs> and 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 maybe Clara that is a much more expert will have a different opinion uh, I don't think there is much that um, the, the EU can do. Okay, Karina, thank you very much. Then, uh, please. Sure, I'll, I'll try to make three quick points. So first of all, I think the EU has a critical role insofar as it uh, provides a means for side payments to induce some cooperation from countries that may not otherwise. Uh, and I think in that context, one of the things that we are missing in terms of sanctions effectiveness is the fact that the US and Canada and the non-NATO members participating aren't really providing the kind of support to Europe that it needs, given that it's bearing the bulk of the cost of the sanctions in the, in the hydrocarbon sense. So I think, uh, you know, that's what's missing. I think that 
they're doing other things, but they're really not helping the European countries overcome the cost of this. Uh, with respect to the 2014 sanctions, exactly. I think this is the reason why incremental sanctions are perceived as being less effective. It, it gives the target state time to adjust, and it gives the target states population time to to recalibrate their expectations. So I think that the 2014 uh, episodes were really problematic uh, and, and consistent with the with the kind of expectations or predictions coming out of out of the empirical analysis. And finally, I think the more critical problem of what's left in the toolbox, uh, I agree with Karina, there's not much there. The only one that really comes up I think is working on non-participating states. So we've seen China kind of sit on the fence on a few of these issues. They're not coming out vocally, but they're also not really facilitating as much as people feared they might. But I think that there's room to be pushing on some of the other non-participating countries uh, and say, look, this is a fundamental issue of international security and you're on the wrong side of the fence. Uh, and so you should be facilitating these sanctions and, and at least not uh, assisting Russia to overcome them. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. Clara, would you like to add something? Thank you very much. Well, uh, I would just uh, like to, uh, to agree with my co-panelists that we are reaching the end of the toolbox and that there's not much left that can be activated anymore. Uh, I think that the fact that we have been witnessing the debate uh, about the um, theories and visas shows that we are already reaching the end of the of the toolbox. But at the same time, uh, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, even though we have seen relatively modest impacts, the sanctions are uh, very costly. The packages that are already in place, they are going to be very costly particularly in terms of the reversibility. I mean, there are some, some uh, things that will never pick up uh, again. And uh, if we look at the, um, the uh, bans or the restrictions that have been put on the export of technology, we are not talking about sanctions anymore. We are talking about export controls and export controls follow a very different logic. They are not meant to be temporary. So, um, even though for the time being we have not been overwhelmed by the um, by major impacts, they are starting to show now and they will increase. So basically, it's a, it's a, I mean the the time it works against uh, Russia in this uh, as far as the effects of the sanctions are concerned. Uh, the key issue here is that the reversibility of these measures is not comparable to the standard sanctions that the EU have, has been imposing in the past. So um, it might not be very um, overwhelming or very eye-catching at the moment, but in the long term, we are going to see that this was a, a, a major sanctions exercise. Thank you. Uh, yes, Clara, thank you very much, which means that once the sanctions will uh, have the full effect, we will have a stagnating economy, right? And a very poor economy in the big country. Uh, so that would uh, have some further problems, I believe, but that's the personal opinion for the moment. Thank you very, very much for answering these questions. I would like to thank our audience for uh, taking time to listen and for questions uh, asked. Uh, thank you for being here today. And I wish you uh, a good evening or a nice day, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. And hope that our discussion will contribute to, um, to the policy debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.